Next question, please. Yes, going on with the notion that human beings aren't meant to kill, I was wondering if you were ever planning on specifically delving into our dependence on animals and the animal industry. I, I think uh, there's a great deal of brutality, of course, in the animal industry. I think in the future there are many other ways of manufacturing protein-based materials that do not involve killing animals. There's a lot of science through um, in, in, in vitro development. There's things that really aren't being pushed forward right now for that type of development. I think in the future, uh, if we were continuing a humane path, there, we would, there would be no need to kill or slaughter any animals in the future. That it's certainly a possibility for a general nutrition. And, and to maintain texture. I mean, they're, you can, they're printing, speaking of 3D printing, they print organs now. It's very subtle, but they're beginning to print organs. You could print meat. Because you go line by line, cell by cell. You can make an imitation steak that is 100% the exact quality that you get from a cow. So I love science. Absolutely. <laughs> Would you plan on doing maybe like, displaying that in a film coming up? Well, I'm, well I made Including that point animals. in the film. I saw it there. But uh, I, you know, I, there's only so much I can cover. I, I feel that that is a relevant point, but I don't necessarily think it's... It's almost a given in my mind, you know? I mean, I understand the importance of, uh, you know, the... Yeah, I understand the, the issue at hand, and not to mention, you know, the fur industry, ugh, it's just, it's all so horrifying uh, beyond the meat industry. I mean, there's all sorts of other levels to it, too. Uh, we Just keep one thing in mind, we're coming out of a position of evolution. Human beings have had to eat meat in order to survive in their nutrition, but we're changing. We're developing new tactics and new techniques. So I don't put anybody down that eats meat. I don't eat much meat. Occasionally I will, though. It's just the way I've been raised. I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, I, I prefer not to eat meat, frankly, but I get in patterns of behavior where I, I can't quite function. It's really a disability of my not having time to efficiently be, be healthy. But uh, in the future, I, I, can't, I see this evolution occurring where you can create the nutrition. So I'll leave it at that. You're halfway there. <laughs> Next question, please. Uh, well, I had a similar question to that. As far as particulars in the new society, um, as far as uh, would weapons be allowed to be produced, as as well as something like meat, even though these might be looked down on by the majority of the society. And also on a side note, just an um, observation, how come other than Roxanne Meadows, you don't include many women in your movies? <laughs> it's, uh, I, it's not a choice. <laughs> I, I, uh, unfortunately, um, a lot of the categories of data and the people that pursue these types of you know, these types of uh, academic interests tend not to be women, they tend to be male dominated. Also, as another point of evolution, uh, it's, a, it's been a very short period of time before women have been given any real credence of development of what their role is. You have to remember, it was you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, there was a very firm di difference. And in fact, in other countries, it very much still exists. So it, it's not a decision on my part to do that, please. I, I'd certainly, uh, it was I would, just I would an in fact, observation I was making. I wasn't accusing you oh, no, of anything. I, I was just, it was just something I noticed that there. I can't, no I can't, uh, for the sake of information, I can't just say, oh, I need more women. Right. <laughs> you know. Right. Um, <laughs> but. Um, Even though you just inserted yourself in the next Zeitgeist film. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Good plug. But my, my original question was about uh, weapons. So uh, your, your question is, would people be allowed to have weapons? Allowed? Are you, are you. See, the thing is about the, the issue of weapons and all these things that we assume are, are givens in society. Um, culturally speaking, we assume that these things are important to consider because of the fact that they're simply culturally dominant. As time moves forward, I don't think anyone would even know what a weapon is. If you go back to early Christopher Columbus time, when he first came to America, he showed them a gun and a spear, even a spear, a sword, excuse me, these indigenous people didn't know what the hell a sword even was. They didn't have the violence. They didn't have tools of violence. But we know now. We know. Well, I know. But my point are. is, my point is, is that there's, if if this has occurred in the past, we can evolve back into a society that is not, you know, based on this these lunatics that think that everyone should walk around with a gun and that's going to somehow make them safe. You know what I mean? It, it, to the effect that if the change is possible to go into a society where to move into a society where there's no need to even consider to have some kind of weapon and protection like that. I mean, I, 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 I see that being extremely possible. What about like bow and arrow for recreation? Well, that's fine. <laughs> we think about, well, if there's any, the only, th the only real threats are the threats to humanity as a whole. So if there's, if there's ever such a thing as, quote, a military establishment, it would be guided in things towards, say, a meteorite that might come and, and hurt us. 
That's about the only real attribute I can think of where you can rationalize the use of weapons. But when it comes to human behavior, when you think about the causal attributes of what violence is, how it accumulates, uh, the monetary system, uh, America has 30 to 300 times more violence than any other country. Why is that? It has to do with the extreme division of rich and poor. When you resolve all those issues and you begin to make a humane society, no one would even think about wanting to own a gun. Most people don't today. I don't want a gun. I mean, but most people will be even much more distant in the future. So that's all I can really say. It's, things we find as cultural norms today are not necessarily empirical. Um, we just have to remember that we just assume that. It's, it's a tendency of every single generation to think that everything that's happening around them is empirically finite, and that's the way it's, it is and the way it's always going to be. That's simply not true. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. I always begin with gratitude, so thank you for living your mission, for contributing to the evolution of the species. Thanks. And I am absolutely in profound awe at the depth at which you went into the subconscious programming from the limbic birth imprint. Mm. And my question is, what support do you need from the other ambassador wings that are all around the globe, we call ourselves compassion economy or generosity economy or what Lewis Hyde calls erotic commerce based on eros, which is the authentic power of the human heart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you have a sisterhood here for you and willing to build bridges. Well, building bridges is, uh, is critically important and that's a very beautiful statement. Um, what do I need in, in that regard? <laughs> well, I'll bring it down to a slightly more practical level and to the effect that, to the effect that uh, I, uh, I only can hope that the Zeitgeist movement, which is this initial attempt, uh, I don't know of any other movement that uh, exists of a global nature that's attempting something like this and, they, and, and, and has the courage to present the observations that it does. I, 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 bridging differences, I can only hope that people will basically come into the movement, not say, oh, we are in partnership with the movement. I, I don't like that. I think people need to absorb into it and say, I work with other movements, but I'm also in the movement, not yes. I'm in the movement that's a partner with the movement. We don't want division. We want to establish a, a unified front. Um, where it, yeah, I'll leave it at that, but that's, that's really what needs to happen. So the other ambassadors would get connected to your chapter leaders and begin that rapport? Yes, exactly. Okay. In the various regions. It's done. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, next question. Please. Hello. Thank you again. My question pertains Sorry. specifically to uniform commercial code and how it ties into what I like to call the fictional reserve banking system. And uh, do, you, do you feel that uh, taking steps to learn about and actually declare your common law sovereignty would be a, one of the prudent first steps into bringing a resource-based economy into fruition? Common law sovereignty, I've met a few people that seem to have had success with that. Um, it's very few and far between, though. Jordan I, Maxwell had... What's that? Jordan Maxwell speaks about... It. He is, but you notice that he doesn't actually have that status. Yeah, I know, I know. So, <laughs> you know, I, there's, a, there's a huge theoretical thing, and I, I have met people that have successfully done it for a little while. But you have to understand the legal system can change anything it wants to. So if you, if you can find that loophole, that's great, but it, it isn't a solution. I think people that want to pursue it should do it just as one more front to challenge. Mm -hmm. It isn't something that I feel is a resolution, as a, excuse me, as a tactic to resolution that I would employ or advocate in the Zeitgeist movement. I just, I don't really buy it in the full extent. I don't think it has longevity. Okay. So I, that's, that's my opinion on it. I, cool, yeah. thank you. Sure, thank you. Next question, please. Uh, I wanted to congratulate you and everybody in the room for being among the few intellectuals on the planet who can really make a change. We are the answer, and so let's make this happen. But I wanted to ask you specifically, it seems to me that the root of most every cause of difficulty on the planet, first of all, is human created, and next of all, is based on greed. And I'm curious to know if there's anybody who's done any kind of studies or currently doing any research into the reversal of greed in the current hierarchy of power with respect to how it's developed in utero or environment or whatever the cause of it is, but ultimately to reverse the greed that seems to be systemic from top down. 
Uh, the only way you can reverse the greed is to reverse the system because the system magnifies it, it supports it, it promotes it. it, it greed is the greed is the um, greed is like the religious. Uh, it's like the divinity of this system. It's like, it's the divine right to be oh, greedy. Yeah. And, and the only way you can resolve that in the basic human behavioral sense and the conditioning orientation is to establish a system that doesn't reward it. I see. Yeah. And the last touch, um, why are you in LA tonight given the whole world is experiencing your magic in, over the past 24 hours? Why not? What, why am why I in LA? Is he here? I mean, I'm just curious to know why. Well, this chose... is the this is the big release. Yes, of course, absolutely. And I'll be in New York actually tomorrow. Yes, for three days, I believe. Yes. How do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Where's my bodyguard? <laughs> Peace. <laughs> Thank you. But I think it's also the way it started with Zeitgeist, because you sure. you flew in from New York. Mm -hmm. to Los Angeles for the first one. So right. I, I think it's just uh, keeping that yeah, And the response in LA has always been larger than anywhere else. Well, maybe there's some other play other countries, but as far as the US, you know, there's, uh, the, the people have always been more supportive you know, in, in mass, at least as, a, as my experience. But uh, I think we've sold out every show we've ever done together. So that's great to see that support. OK. Next Peter, question. thank you for your films, first of all. Sure. Um, to better frame my question, I'll introduce myself. My name is Dutch Merrick. I've spent my career working in entertainment, media and advertising, and came to the realization that that whole process is the process of selling people on individuality, consumption, and a blind faith in this economic system. Yes. Just blind, as, as religious as anything else. So, yes, absolutely. Um, and so for my penance, or trying to pay that off, I've, I... <laughs> volunteered with uh, Dennis Kucinich and his presidential campaign and Ralph Nader as a filmmaker to use those skills as you have to try to move the other messages forward and counter that. Uh, additionally, I volunteered KPFK 90.7 FM radio, which is the only broadly based media outlet that would dare play anything like this, excerpts, or have any kind of dialogue about that. Um, I encourage everybody to support that type of media. 90.7 FM, I started there eight years ago as a phone banking volunteer. And now I've worked my way up. I was uh, recently elected to the chairman of the local station board. So by consistently putting an effort from the ground up, we can make a difference. I just remind, want to remind people, they don't have to be a filmmaker. They can donate to, to broader causes. Absolutely. My question is, our framing is that individuality trumps all. Because I'm an American, I'm number one, I deserve it. I need a Chevy or a, you know, a certain <laughs> bottle of wine or I'll never get laid again. <laughs> When we see the market crashes in Europe, there's millions of people taking to the streets. When the Iraq war was about to gear up, millions of people took to the streets. And when Americans are asked about that, they see it as ridiculous that French farmers would park their tractors on highways and protest, or people would protest against changing uh, uh, the retirement age. How do we break the spell on Americans that individuality trumps collectivism, and that when we all benefit, we all benefit? Well, I think the only way, frankly, it's going to happen is by, um, by the fact that the standard of living in America that has essentially been the result of the exploitation of uh, most of the East, such as from the early days of Britain and the East India Company to the what is, we call globalization is really colonialization. Uh, America has hijacked the most of the world and taken advantage of just about every other country out there. And other countries have been absolutely subservient, such as China. China has continued to exploit all of their people in favor of exporting their crap to us at an outrageously cheap rate. It goes on and on. Sweatshop slavery, John Perkins from Zeitgeist to Dendam details the colonialistic attribute of America. That's not going to go on for that much longer. It can't, which is why these wars are developing so quickly and why there's so much tension now with, of course, energy and the Iraq war and oil. Uh, it, regardless of how much they, they try to take over and to maneuver in order to try and keep uh, well, what did George Bush say, that the, that the uh, America's lifestyle was un, uh, what do you say, it was un, uh, uncompromisable. He said something really belligerent a while back uh, like this. And, That's and the fact is... one of his new words, right? Uncompromisable? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, uh, it, there's no way the standard of living in America is going to maintain what it has. And if you want to see us angry little children 
that are going to get mad and have tenter tan temper tantrums when they can't, you know, get in their huge Hummer and they have to spend, you know, four dollars a gallon on gas and they actually have to think conservatively, then you're going to see America have a real temper tantrum and that's going to lead to a change of values one way or another. And that's inevitable, by the way. So, so you just you just wait and watch the fireworks of the next decade. It's going to be really interesting. Well, this will be one of the triggers that'll help educate people. I Thank hope you. so. Quick shout out to Jason Lord uh, for all of his efforts in California, and I'd like to say he's a good friend of mine. Absolutely, Jason's been a and big help. Also, John Wenger, fellow uh, fellow local station board member. John, good evening. Thank you. Next question, please. Yeah, hi Dutch, and thanks for the plug for KPFK. Uh, <laughs> I'm also on the board there. I'd also like to thank the audience for being so darn young. I don't see too many gray hairs here. I go to a lot of political things, and uh, I see a lot of people my age in the 50s and 60s, and I'm happy to see young people here in a what you might think of as a revolutionary movement. I think you're the only people that have the energy to, to fulfill it. And uh, uh, so it's, it's good to see you here, and I thank you for that. Uh, a, a quick. A quick, con a quick, I have a two-part question, but a quick answer to Dutch's question. I think the answer is, is abundance. If you, if you get the society giving abundance to the people, then they can afford to be generous and they stop being greedy. They can afford to do that. So, but they also have to understand that property is a, is a detrimental idea. That yeah. Owning a car is a horrible concept, that you don't use it that often. You need to create a system of sharing that's very efficient so people can have access. So that's, that's, a, that's a one concept that I just want to throw in there. That's, you can't provide just a, a raw abundance and have everyone have a one of everything. That's a completely idiotic, you know, I'm not saying that's what you're saying, by the way. But that's the way a lot of people think. And in fact, I get that question a lot. They say, well, what if I want a ski boat? And uh, I'm like, well, you know, you can have access to these things. So how many times a day do you use your ski boat? Um, <laughs> So, I, I completely agree. In fact, I had the idea once that if we, if, we, if we had the money to fund sustainable energy such that it was essentially electricity be free in, in the city of downtown LA, then you could get these little golf carts, which cost about a thousand dollars. Absolutely. And you could just make them available as, as just like shopping carts, except they'd have to stay within, within the little electric grid area. Uh, and so they just would be run around downtown pollution free. And uh, you, just, you just borrow them like a shopping cart and use them and you're done. You park them. And, and many, many sustainable ideas. Uh, you, it's almost endless how much more efficient things could be if we actually cared to make them so. But what was your question? My question is this. Uh, I, I'm a member of the public banking movement, and I'm going to join your movement. Okay. And, this, and my question is, do you think, as I do, that the public banking movement, uh, probably instantiated as a state bank in, in California, a state bank owned by the people of the citizens of California for the benefit of the people of California to create jobs and infrastructure such as sustainable energy systems for the state of California, will be the quickest way for the people to take control of, the, of their own finances, which ultimately is just money. And so since the banks make money out of nothing by basically uh, leveraging it, uh, the state of California, which has a couple hundred billion dollars of assets, could uh, do the same thing and basically pay totally for the sustainable infrastructure you'd like to see. And so that's part of one of my questions. I, I could say, transitionally speaking, I would agree. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of ideas like that. That sounds completely logical and legitimate to me. I am, um, I, I am not really. One thing that I have to think more so about, which I, I tend not to, are these, are ideas like that, these transitional ideas, which is, which are important. It's a very difficult world to navigate and to even consider how to move from this system to a new system. I agree with you. I would, I think that's a, that's a fair, that's a fair concept. Absolutely. Well, and since you're looking for women for your next movie, it, uh, this, uh, there's a woman in L.A. named Ellen Brown who writes an awful lot of articles. Oh, yeah, about, I know Ellen. You know, well, yeah, I know you do. And she said she was, your, was, part of your, was part of your advisor. It's one of your first films or something. The second yeah, one, yeah. Second one. Anyhow, uh, she's available in L.A. and uh, she's got a in new institute now. I'll give a plug. The, it's publicbankinginstitute.org, which is going to be providing educational information about the public banking movement. Okay. Thank Good. you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Um, I'd just like to, to know if uh, there, do you have any other solution to uh, making all this happen if, if, you, if it's not advocated through some sort of violence. I mean, complacency is really, you know, really bad in America. 
you know? And no one's really, well, just really willing to stand up for what they, they really want. There's a difference between violence and, and non, well, and not giving in to the system. Uh, obviously, I don't, I can't add it. Violence doesn't work. It just, it's not even a matter, it's not a matter of well, we well, should or should. One, well, well, you were just saying, talking about letting it implode on itself, even when that happens, the people that are sitting around, or standing around having tantrums because they can't drive their Hummers are going to be pretty mad. Well, that's an unfortunate and difficult subject. I mean, it's very, uh, it's very uh, spooky to think about what is in store for society as all of these problems continue to arise. I'm, I am certainly not happy to, to, to even think about it. And I'm not, I'm not sitting here in, in a position of power to say that I could tell you, excuse me, that I could, add, I could set in motion anything that I think would involve change. Here's what I will say as far as the Zeitgeist Movement, though. My goal is to get as much mass awareness as possible and then engage in strategic, Nonviolent action that shuts the system down in certain ways to draw attention to the movement, to draw attention to certain attributes of it, not in a way that, that can be considered terroristic, but then again, they could probably be given that label by anyone that doesn't like it. Yeah, if the they, public stands up in mass, as I depict in the end, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's no, there's, imagine if 50% of the American public stopped paying income taxes. Do you think they're going to prosecute all of you? Yeah, that's no. <laughs> they can't do a damn thing. The goal of divide and conquer of the, of the population, which is exactly how the societies have been ruled since the divinity of kings, is to set up constant division and permeate division as much as possible, has to be overcome before a real transition can emerge in a way that I think can work out, which is an absolute global presence where the government step back and they're like, we don't know what the fuck's going on. Yeah. Or they, don't, they can't even take control of anything. The United Nations has to sit back and start to bring in people because there's so much demand generated by their, all the country's populations for this, for this idea that they simply have to let go. That's as, as radical and as, as difficult as that may seem, but that's the only way I see it happening. Um, and that's exactly what I'm going for. And it can happen very fast. And the catalyst of this is the breakdown. So all those people that have their Hummers, they might eventually say to themselves, you know what, why did I have this big Hummer anyway since oil's finite, you know, this doesn't make a lot of sense. They might actually wake up. I think people will wake up. And they're gonna be forced to wake up one way or another. That's the way I, I see thank it. You. Sure, thank you. And I think what, just to, to go along the lines of what you were just discussing, because we've talked about this before, and I think instead of uh, shutting down, uh, because that still comes across as a pushing against, yeah, using it's, the... it's, 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 it's going beyond shutting, shutting it down. It's, it's going to the level of transforming it. Absolutely. And I, I think once you, you get to that point, then the people that are involved in that machine, for example, willingly go because they see, now I get how this applies to me and how this benefits me versus uh, someone trying to come and take my power away. Sure. I guess when I say shutting down, I, I feel that there are tactics that could be used that are very simple, but would disturb the functionality of society so profoundly that the people that are in orchestration of all of this would have to take notice. And if enough people are there, then you know, this is, as a process of transition, the only way I see it, I, the Montgomery bus boycotts. Remember what they did? They actually just they stopped using the buses, and they lost so much money that they had to they had to change it. They had to change the law. This same type of logic, I think, will permeate. Absolutely. And uh, again, that ridiculous, dramatic gesture at the end. I agree with that notion, but I'm not advocating that idea. I'm talking about people finally coming together for the common good across all religions, across all races, across all classes. This is is inevitable. Okay. It's going to happen one way or another. It's been, we've been gravitating towards more human unity. The internet has made the world so much smaller. We can communicate with people. I mean, it's a cultural nightmare for the power establishment because they can't push the jingoism anymore. Yeah. People are slowly be realizing that everyone's more or less the same. And uh, that's a critical revelation that I think is going to take hold and eventually make this self-evident. So. No, that's true. And, and that's something that we also notice you know, the, all the years that we've been, that we've been uh, doing the Artivist Film Festival, we've noticed that as well. You know, we've had, uh, for example, um, uh, a journalist from the LA Times came up to us once and said, you know, I love this festival. It's the only place where you can get the human rights and the animal rights people in one place and you don't have to call the cops, <laughs> you know? 
That's a good because point. It, it's not about who's right, who's better. It, it really is about collaboration, and it's really it's not about competition. It's about finding the common ground. Finding the common and ground. And the common ground exactly. is our basic survival, and it, we're our basic survival, and, and un, un, unlike every other period of history, is now in serious question because of the system that we generated. And I think that that, that risk is going to finally bring people to a level to recognize the commonality at the very core level. And that is the transformation. And that That's essentially will lead into the transformation. Begins, is that common ground? The, the, the trick, though, is not to let it get too bad. I frankly believe that the sickness and addiction and distortion of the people that are in power is, is so, so bad that they would literally sit by and let millions and millions of people just die, as they do already, but billions of people die, and just watch them die, and to find a way to justify it in that Adam Smith kind of invisible hand way, that this is just the way it is, this is social Darwinism, they will block or then blinker themselves out, and that's why I think the, it's a cancer, basically. It's a cancer that is spread. You have to have the immune system rise to fight this cancer on some level. Not, not violent, but on some level we have to do something. Uh, before you know, we pass the point of no return in the, in the words of Jacques Fresco. So. That's the spirit of a new day and this film is, is that connection and that common ground. Yes, yes, exactly.